Saturday in Chicago, 88.3 FM. And we are so fortunate to have with us uh, at WZRD via Zoom, Asada Moore, founder of Black Math Genius. Welcome, Asada. Hi, thank you. Oh, thank you for joining us. We uh, provided our listeners a little information about Black Math Genius uh, uh, the last five minutes. And uh, uh, but it's best for you to tell us what is the Black Math Genius Program? Absolutely. Black Math Genius Program um, started actually in the late 90s. Uh, at the time, it was by a different name, African Mathematical Genius. And basically, when I was a college student, I started volunteering at a charter school doing the advanced math concept that I was doing in college with middle school students. And they were picking up on it from trigonometry um, to physics, bridge design. And I just kept moving forward with it. The principal loved it. So what it is in its uh, current form is we offer tutoring services as well as a video program that we have with a series of 60 videos that's basically teaching children the true origins of mathematics and very conscious about building students' confidence so that they're strong in mathematics, but also that they're interested enough that they want to stick with it for a career. Mm -hmm. Once um, you build their confidence, then uh, and they become more interested in it, they'll uh, work more at it. And the more they work at math, the better they become. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, but also, they have to be okay with struggling in a healthy way. Because mathematics is the subject where it, it, it's the most anxiety-filled subject out of all of the school subjects, right? And so part of it is because people are uncomfortable with struggling and not getting things quote unquote correct at the first shot. Um, so we're, we're also very patient with students and teach them the importance of healthy struggle and persisting at things. Well, um, that um, uh, impression that um, uh, uh, mindset of struggling, that might yeah, actually come from adults, right? Because um, uh, adults are saying, oh, they say a lot that, oh, math, uh, that's a hard subject. And, and that influences the kids. If, they, if the kids don't even view math as a, as a hard, difficult subject, is that, that, does that make it different for, for them to learn? You're absolutely correct. And a lot of times it's, it's, it, it starts with parents. Parents would say things like, man, math wasn't my subject either. So if they got a C in it, that's pretty good for them. As if the inability is hereditary. It is not, okay? It's all a mental construct that we have. So yes, that comes from adults. But even with our children, we say, uh, do it the way that we taught you, okay? Do it this way. Show your work. If a student has the ability to figure things out in their head, then what is the need to show their work, mm -hmm. right? So we have to allow children um, to think and use their own ways of getting at problems and solving things. Oh, so you um, actually uh, teach them to be uh, to um, be creative to uh, to solve the problem, but uh, it's okay to solve it in a different way from what the teacher said. Absolutely, absolutely. They're multiple, and in fact. I like to show them the problem and then let them know to choose which way is best for them or way, mm -hmm. as long as the rule can apply to any similar problem, similar to like your for properties, right, out of numbers. Um, so showing them multiple ways because some students are going to learn, let me correct that, all students are going to learn, learn things differently and Right. There, there were such initiatives such as um, uh, No Child Left Behind. So what is different? Um, or why, why does the uh, children in No Child Left Behind, uh, they seem to still have problems with math, but uh, how, how is uh, Black Math Genius different? And how, I, I know that you're telling us like uh, what we spoke about earlier, but why, why is it that, that uh, no child, why is it that no child left behind uh, does not help 
improve the math skills of uh, children as, um, as they wanted it to be? Uh, because the only thing that changed was the amount of money being spent. And so publisher companies, publishing companies received bigger checks and they created fancier looking textbooks, but the techniques and the paradigm are still the same. And so we have not done it and there has not been a focus on who the children are that are in front of them. And so the data has remained flatlined. We're falling significantly more behind mm -hmm. in the 20 years since Common Core and No Child Left Behind. So nothing has really changed other than the budget. Mm -hmm. With the Black Math Genius, our focus is on students and who they are and getting at deep conceptual understanding, not just rote memory or regurgitating facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a big difference. So, uh, Black Math Genius um, teaches about Egyptian uh, mathematics. Can you give us an example of uh, Egyptian mathematics? Absolutely, there there are a few. First of all, our Hindu Arabic number system that we use, and it's interesting that most Americans don't even know where the number system comes from. There was a survey recently asking if they would want to use Arabic numbers. And the majority of the people said no, but we are using Arabic numbers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But that Hindu Arabic number system, that is a base 10 number system, a positional number system, that was originally used in Egypt. The other thing is what we know as the Pythagorean theorem was actually being used by Egyptians. There's still evidence of this in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. It was uh, being the ancient Egyptians more than 2,000 years before Pythagoras was born. That's another example. A third example is when you look at the concept of unit fractions, the ancient Egyptians were the first to uh, work on unit fractions. And we see this eye of Haru. And when you go through the story of the eye of Haru, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, the different parts of the eye, those are unit fractions where 1 64th is missing. But also, if you look at the bottom of those uh, numbers and denominators, those are our binary numbers. So there's a lot of mathematics that has its origin going back to South Africa, Central Africa, but especially in ancient Egypt. That is where it really came together. Did the ancient Egyptians use this uh, Egyptian mathematics to build the pyramids? Yes, absolutely. Had a concept of maybe using geometry, trigonometry, and uh, just basic mathematics. Yes. Mm. And um, there's also, um, so how is Egyptian uh, mathematics connected to Black history? Just um, you know, give us a, a little little primer about that. Absolutely. Ancient Egypt is, at the time, was known as Kemet, K-M-T, or some people spell it K-E-M-E-T. Kemet is known as the land of the Blacks. And so those were people that originally from Central Africa, East Africa, migrated to the north and settled and built Egypt um, around the Cairo region, Alexandria, so on and so forth. So the connection is, is that those ancient Egyptians are originally black people, not the Arab people that you see there today. Similarly, when you come to the United States, the, the people you see in the United States are not of Americans that were here originally. So it's the same thing in Egypt. So that is the uh, connection there is that those are African people um, of black origin. Mm -hmm. And um, when, uh, so this is not taught in uh, regular uh, curriculum in, in schools, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, you kind of fuck that is, out a little bit. <laughs> Correct, but, that, but, it, but it's important. Yes, 
Absolutely, um, for um, for all children to learn. So when um, children um, hear that, uh, and when they learn this, uh, uh, do you do you uh, have you seen their feedback? Uh, they they learn it, and then uh, do they uh, say that they learn something else, or as uh, uh, do they do they accept it for what it is uh, immediately? Um, uh, I yeah, well, it's yeah, cool. yeah, there there are two reasons to teach um, culture and mathematics. One, it teaches you a respect for all people. So not only learning about black mathematics, but we also teach them as well. Japan, Spanish, we do the Rikiman sequence that is from Colombia. So we show them that all people have contributed to mathematics. The traditional curriculum that they look at is, it's mostly white men. Mm -hmm. We don't look at the cont contributions from China, from Japan, from South America, from the Native Americans. The Native Americans, like the people in West Africa, they use the vigesimal decimal system, which is base 20. So we look at all people. But the other thing is, everyone wants to feel that their people contributed. What does it look like if I'm sitting in the classroom and I'm only learning about geniuses, but they none of them look like me? So it's important for those two reasons, for self, but also so that you can have respect for other people. Do you have um, any um, uh, insight about, uh, or maybe you have um, seen how uh, children react to uh, this uh, this history because uh, if they're in your program they learn a lot about uh, uh, history and mathematics um, uh, what is what are children's reactions to to learning this they are loving it their families especially their parents are loving it what we're finding with the students is that when we do our tutoring session if i get a on this early, there are students waiting for me there. A session is supposed to last an hour. Sometimes they'll take me over. Current sessions that are supposed to last an hour, we've had some to go as long as three hours because they've never heard it before, so interested in it, and they have so many questions. Mm -hmm. So the engagement is really high, really energetic, and they want more. When um, you ask uh, parents to um, guide their children, to uh, participate in guiding their children so that uh, children as uh, young as uh, three years old could start learning, uh, do the parents learn as well? And how does this learning affect them and their careers? Uh, did you get any feedback from the parents? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So Yes, with some of the summer programming that we're doing right now, especially with the coding, because we have some parents, they're getting their own device, their own computer, and they're doing the course with their children. We had one parent, I think she was out of London, and she called in and she said that she went through the program because she was going for her plumbing license, and she went through to learn the mathematics that we were doing in the program. So parents are benefiting in a way that we didn't think that parents would want to jump in and learn the material as well, but they are. Yes, but because um, uh, we all could use some help in math. But what about you? Um, you you didn't have uh, black math genius when you were growing up, but you became uh, very interested and proficient in math. So how how did that happen? Well, I started off, quote unquote, um, having a natural affinity towards mathematics, and I follow rules. And so it's easy for students that follow the rules to do well in school. It's students that are going to be more creative, want to do their own thing, that are going to have more difficulty. Doesn't mean that one is smarter than the other. It's just that I followed the rules. And then as I got into college and started to study engineering and computer science, I kept seeing how mathematics was important in all of that. And so I was more geared towards mathematics and fully understanding mathematics. 
and then I looking at the data and seeing how few people are really good in mathematics, it drove my interest to want to bring more people into loving mathematics the way that I do. When you were uh, working through, uh, when you were learning at the in co at the college level, etc., uh, and you see these connections uh, math, uh, with math and the other subjects, um, that uh, it was uh, mostly you. You it, you were just like stepping back in and looking, and you saw these connections. And then uh, you, did you figure out that if people were better at math, then uh, they would uh, be uh, more likely to succeed at these other difficult subjects. Absolutely. And in fact, that's been years of studying and looking at it. Recently, I read a report within the past year or two that by the year 2040, Black people will have a net worth of zero. So I started looking at that. And what I'm finding is that that's and, and, and this is the Federal Reserve Bank that's providing that data. What's happening is they're able to look at school age children, look at how where they're doing in math and determine what their salary is going to be based off of that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm finding is that one out of five black people, 20% by default, choose a major that's gonna have them impoverished for another generation. And we're grossly underrepresented in every STEM field. Okay, so if you instead look at Asian people, Asian people are grossly overrepresented in STEM fields. It would be like Black people showing up to compete and we send one Black person and nine Asians show up. That's what the difference is. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we're only showing up at one third of a rate as we should be. Asians are showing up three times what their population is. That's a 9x difference. And so when you then you look out and say, wait a minute, the world is only getting more technical. We're moving into the metaverse, cryptocurrency, smart contracts, and things like that, where it's going to have even more understanding of mathematics and programming. And Black people aren't going into those fields. You have some students that um, uh, graduated from your program. Uh, what is the old the student the, like the your let's say your first student that ever graduated from Black Math Genius? How old is that student now? And um, do you um, find that your uh, your graduates are uh, entering the STEM fields and these uh, and these fields that that uh, you talk about? Uh, do you do follow up on on how how they're doing? Absolutely. The oldest students are uh, around 33, 34 years old mm -hmm. and had them when they were in middle school. So it's been uh, between uh, 20 and 26 years, depending on which students. So 26 years would be the uh, longest. And when I, matter of fact, I just visited one of my students that uh, graduated. He's in Georgia and one of the animal feed plants. He's the lead engineer. He's the supervisor engineer for that plant the only black person at the plant mm -hmm. and he's a supervisor. Many of my students go into STEM fields, even students that were labeled. I have a student that was labeled dyslexia. He had an IEP and he is now a medical doctor working on his PhD to one day be president of a hospital. Mm -hmm. I had another student that worked with Uber um, and uh, other students, like I said, that are in tech, and they're all over the country. One of my former students is now a principal. Mm -hmm. uh, I have three of my former students that are working for me in the Black Math Genius program. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of stayed in that, in that area. I also have, uh, when I, uh, years ago, when I started with the Python coding, I made it a requirement as I, I was the principal, I made it a requirement that all students would take AP computer science. When they looked at how many students I had enrolled in that course, they said if I were a state, I would be ranked seven with the number of black students enrolled in AP computer science. Because first of all, schools don't make AP computer science or any AP course a requirement. For me, that meant every student had to take it 
with an IEP, with the 504 plan, it didn't matter. And students did really well. Mm -hmm. So you have to have high expectations. Students will more than likely rise to those high expectations. Let's say you have um, some students that begin uh, at three. How long is an average uh, uh, stay for a student in Black Mat Genius? Most of the instruction and the things that I've done, we I've worked with students about three to four years on average, three to four years. Ideally, we would like to see a student come in and stay with us their whole school age years from uh, when they enter right now, we're starting our tutoring service at third grade, but they can order the, the boot camp at any grade. We would like them see, to see them stay until they get to college. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, when, uh, do you know why they don't stay? Is it that they uh, just, um, uh, they, the lives change or is there, what is the reason, do you know, that they don't stay long? Yeah, most, uh, well, the the iteration that we're in now is relatively new. So mm -hmm. we'll see how long we can have stay. But previously, um, you, 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 had a, you have a lot of movement with students. When I was teaching and using the Black Map Genius program, you, have, you just have a lot of movement with students. And, and that's just natural, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, Bill Morton. He's the uh, president of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. He also is a fellow broadcaster at WZRD, and uh, and uh, we do a lot of uh, community advocacy. And uh, uh, Bill and I spoke, uh, discussed a lot about uh, Black Bear Genius, uh, and uh, you know how how incredible it is. We wish that you know we learn about it sooner. Um, we uh, you know recently there was an article I think about a year ago and fortune about you, but um, uh, why didn't the press uh, pick up on you sooner? You know, when I was doing, I, I wasn't the best at, at getting out there. Um, I didn't see my, I saw it like, oh, you know, people that are interested into celebrity type stuff, like I just wasn't good with getting out there like that, especially when I was a principal. I was just focused on my students at the time. And it wasn't until I stopped being a principal, retired from being a principal, that I said, hey, this needs to be into more households. Um, so it was something that I could have did a better job at. And so I'm working hard and now to get out there, get in front of more people. So anyone that's listening wants to learn more about it, to have me come out, to speak. Uh, I'm understanding now the importance of that. And Bill, um... Asada uh, mentioned earlier that um, she was uh, living in Rogers Park for a while. Oh, nice. Oh. And I, yeah, because I used to live in Rogers Park for a while. Whereabouts? Uh, on Jarvis, as well oh. as on uh, Estes. We might have bumped right into each there. other earlier right. on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My, my grandmother worked at a couple of those nursing homes right up there off of uh, like Jarvis and uh, Sheridan Road, Sherman Park, all through that way. Yeah, we have a lot of nursing yeah. homes on Sheridan Road, nursing row, yes. uh, home. Yes. Road. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Um, and I worked at that McDonald's off of Granville and Broadway. I oh, think right it's there. still up there. Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I've, I've uh, been there many times before, you know, getting off of Lakeshore Drive or coming to Lakeshore Drive. Yep. Absolutely. That was my first job. <laughs> Broadway area. Um, so I love what you're doing. You're, you're changing lives. Um, you're teaching mathematics. And, you know, I, I was listening in earlier to the interview and I love how um, you incorporate because it, it does naturally incorporate um, science and um, mechanics and all kinds of different areas into mathematics, commerce. You know, I'm the president of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. You cannot do commerce without mathematics or, or computers or anything, anything at all. You cannot do it without mathematics. And I do agree with you that um, maybe um, people are not uh, financially literate or mathematically literate um, or, or, you know, just literate. Um, people need more education, and I really do. Um, I really do appreciate the work you're doing, Asada. Asada was having some uh, buffing issues. She will return very shortly. 
So I was thinking, you know, this conversation kind of makes me think while we're waiting for the buffering to happen. Um, there's a thing called the Fibonacci sequence. It's like um, like a spiral pattern and it's found in nature. And it's, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, you see it in seashells. Uh, sometimes if you look at um, like the trees, they have like a, a circular pattern. Um, it, there's a lot of different uh, things with this Fibonacci sequence. And they say that that's also in our cells. So that is, that's really interesting. And it's related to um, mathematics, of course, but also uh, fractals. Fractals are, are something that I discovered when I was doing video editing. And fractals are like, um, like um, it's a mathematical thing and it's a scientific thing as well. And it's in nature. Uh, you'll see a lot of things are symmetrical or they have different patterns in it that go different ways. And um, I, I really wanted to um, ask Asada about, um, you know, the, the Fibonacci sequence and, and, and fractals as well in, in relation to mathematics and science and nature. Yes, there's a, there's it's something like a, a pattern for life because uh, isn't fractals a little bit, uh, you showed me fractals. I, I thought that they were kind of like uh, the spiral in the Milky Way, but uh, uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then if it's uh, part of the, uh, uh, the cell structure, then it's uh, essential to life. That, that, uh, uh, that spin. So if you look at like a double helix, how it, how it's like um, duality, and how it's, you know, kind of twisting around, um, you know, that's all, that's all mathematics and science. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sada was uh, talking about that, about the physics and all those subjects, how it uh, ties in, uh, all those subjects tie in so uh, closely with mathematics. Let me get into it here. Sure, and, and just another just another observation. I, I do study all of this. Um, some stars, they've and, and planets out there, um, were discovered um, using mathematical equations before they could actually um, see them with with uh, telescopes. So, and then they later on found that those planets and stars were there, which is really really interesting. Mm -hmm. I remember you uh, showing me fractals uh, at the chamber and uh, uh, asking me, have you ever seen fractals before? I seen fractals, but I didn't know that they were fractals and there are an infinite variety and they're so beautiful. Absolutely. And you know, like you can even look at a snowflake, you know, um, although none are exactly alike, none have been found to be exactly alike. Mm -hmm. um, you have, you have symmetry there and that's, and, and patterns and it's, you know, it's all, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, see if I, we could contact uh, Asada. Uh, it seems as if uh, she was doing the interview uh, maybe out of uh, a vehicle and then with the phone, it might've uh, like ran out of juice, but let me see if I could email her and see, see if she could return. Let me just check. I also enjoyed um, earlier in the interview how she was um, speaking on the history, African history and um, the history of, of mathematics as well. Um, you know, we have, the, we have the Arabic numerals, which is another thing I wanted to speak with her about. Um, and, and also um, a little bit more about um, the, the ancient Egyptians and the African culture uh, rather than the, the Arabic culture. Right, yeah, that, I know that you're very, very interested in, uh, in that. You, uh, you watch so many videos on, uh, on history and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ancient history too. So. I could see why you would be interested in this. She would give you much more depth on uh, all the all those uh, all those videos about the subjects that you have been uh, watching over the years. I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> <laughs>
But I, I would love to see I would love to see Asada come in um, to Rogers Park. I'd love to see her come on in and um, you know help our people, teach our youth, teach yeah. their parents, get them excited, get them involved, and have a, a physical location in Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. Yes, she said that she uh, she's willing to work with us. I I asked her about that. Um, uh, in one of our uh, emails conversations, and she said mm -hmm. she's very excited. She would love to do that with us. You know, there's yeah. grants involved that, that that she can get. You know, there's city funding. You know, there's state funding. You know, there's national funding for for a project like this. And um, we would love to have um, to invite and welcome, um, you know, this to to Rogers Park. Absolutely, Asada. Oh, we're so glad to have you back. Uh, we're oh, yeah. going overheated. Oh, I've been on Zoom a lot this morning. Sorry. Oh no, no, no worries at all. Bill, you had a couple of questions for Azada. Sure. While while you were away for a minute, uh, we were talking about uh, different um, um, natural science and mathematical, um, I guess, phenomenon. Um, the the Fibonacci sequence and fractals in particular. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit? Can you teach us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, fractals is you have, uh, which people typically talk about fractals and tessellations together, right? Um, which is uh, basically patterns, repeating uh, patterns. Tessellations more easily recognizable. You see tessellations on your bathroom floors, or on your, your kitchen towel, things like that. Fractals, you can think about like broccoli, right? And so as you zoom in and you continue to break off a piece of broccoli, it looks similar to the original bush, but not necessarily exact, okay? And so fractals is a mathematical uh, pattern. Uh, you can look at fractals also in snowflakes. That would be another example of a fractal. Um, so they're great for doing art projects um, for students that uh, are more on the creative side. It's a great way to introduce and to look at mathematics that way. So when you want to merge mathematics and art together, fractals are a great look for that. Same with tessellations or even with tessellations for uh, construction or architecture. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, which has some similarity to the Rikiman sequence, um, and they're both mathematical sequences. The uh, Fibonacci sequence is a little bit more straightforward where you're adding zero, you don't see zero, one, one and one, you're adding the number to the number prior to and building out this sequence. And you see this a lot, they, we, they talk about it a lot with the reproduction of rabbits would be an example of the Fibonacci sequence. But this pattern emerges a lot. When you look in at stocks with, uh, for those that are traders, there are fib numbers that they look at to determine where a particular stock price is going to go. Um, so it's a uh, patterns and you mentioned nature, things that we see in nature. Nature is very mathematical. You look at the shape of pineapples, the patterns on pineapples, um, being able to determine how old a tree is by looking at the rings on the tree, right? Um, so a lot of mathematics in nature. And we were we were also dis discussing like in our, our DNA structure, like the double helix and, and and what would that be an example of? You know what, with the double helix, there is actually a branch of mathematics called knot theory. And knot theory is you're literally, I took a whole course on this. It was actually my capstone course and looking at DNA and how DNA knots up, looking at the double helix, um, also RNA, ribonucleic acid, right? Um, and looking at how they tie up to potentially look at certain illnesses and diseases. And so there's a whole branch of mathematics that particularly look at that, but they also apply this concept of not theory, what you're looking at with DNA to top topography. We're looking at the flows and the curves of, uh, of land. Um, so, and here's the thing, you know, you think about what we call the unknot, it's just a loop, right? And then you start to do these different terms, is it over and under? And you can look at the double helix with that, right? How it's turned. And then there are equations that we then go through and write based on the knot. 
okay, now I understand the, the not, the non not. I get it now. Not. It's like, it's like yeah. when I have a cable and it's twisted and it does a little now twist. Now not. Yep. It's, you can just pull it and it's not a knot. Yes. Wow. That is, that's exciting. There are knots that are classified by how many knots are in it and whether those knots, uh, how is going under or over. And then we also discussed, we discussed a lot of things while you were away for a minute. Right. Um, we also, we, I also mentioned um, how um, uh, planets and stars um, were discovered before we could see them um, through a telescope or, or anything like that um, through mathematics. And, and they were discovered through math. And then later we were able to see them. Right. <laughs> that, even though we know that, right? It's still mind blowing to me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And so, what was the the, the serious star, right? And uh, looking at stars. But here's the thing: when I went to Egypt, and we took students to Egypt to study the mathematics of the pyramid, and this was in the uh, early 2000s. But once I got to Egypt at night, and I it literally looked like you could reach up and touch those stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, so when, and then when you think about it, you remove all the technology. You can't get on social media. You can't watch TV. You can't binge Netflix series, right? They really had time to truly study nature. Nature was their entertainment. Uh, uh, discovering numbers and the use of numbers, right? Um, so I can see how that's possible, but it's still mind blowing to me to be able to discover something before actually being able to see it. And you have to think about how long it took to do that because they didn't get it right on the first time. Some of these stars is 10 decades, thousands of years even. So that means that they had to document and study this for lifetimes in order to be able to get it correctly. Absolutely, wow, that, that is something. And the um, precision mm -hmm. with what they did these things. A lot of the times they're off like by no more than like a 10th of an inch or whatever the unit is that they're using. When you look at the precision mm -hmm. that they did these, you know, they say some tools can't be calibrated as precise as what they were doing back then. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I was listening in and um, we were talking about uh, the history of civilization and, and math. Um, African history and Arabic history. Um, so, what about the Arabic numerals? What about what, what about the what was that called? An abacus? Yes, the yes. abacus out of China. Um, but this is where you know this is the the beauty of uh, diversity, and one of the beautiful things about different people merging and sharing, right? And so we mostly. Uh, well, we adopted it in the West, right? Using what is the Hindu Arabic number system, right? And so one group of people discovered it, another group of people spread it around the world. And then the other people started using it. That's true teamwork and collaboration, if you will, right? And just imagine, no matter wherever we go in the world, we understand what one is, what two is, what three is, so on and so forth. And of course it could have been named anything. But the world, and we're in the United States where we can't get 50 states to agree on one thing at, at all the time, right? But worldwide, we were able to agree on mathematics. That is one of the most beautiful, beautiful things. So that's proof that we actually can work together and we can agree on, on things, right? Uh, because mathematics has proven for that. And of course, nature helped with that. And, and I also heard, I'll, I'll pick your brain on this one, I also heard that zero was discovered after well, long, long after all of the numbers. Um, I, I wanna confirm that. And also, um, is zero actually a number? Yes, um, it, it's kind of like the unnut, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the unnumber we'll call it, right? <laughs> so yes, and so there's, there's actually uh, stories on that more like kind of like Aesop's fables type thing. And they called it new in you. Or before there was life, there was new, meaning there was nothing, zero, right? And so in some cultures you are here referred to as new, the absence of, yeah. One more, one more for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the deal uh, about um, the difference in the deal between uh, kilometers, 
and miles. I prefer miles. I always grew up with miles, and then I hear on the news kilometers all the time. I always forget the other country, but it's only the United States and one other country that's using the number system that we're using. Everyone else uses kilometers and the other units. So we're the only one that uses. And, and the good thing about it is that it's another learning opportunity, but it also shows that you can define, like we can define what an ASADA is. An ASADA is 2.3 miles, right? You can create a unit of measure, which is how it originally started anyway, right? The Egyptians, when they would use different, you know, their unit of measures being a cubit, measuring from elbow to the tip of the finger, the length of a finger, the length of a hand or a palm as they called it, right? Um, so yes, it's important to know both, especially if you're in the United States. Now, if you're elsewhere, you're in agreement with most of the world. When, when I go to Europe, I'm seeing it represented in kilometers. I'm seeing weight represented in kilograms, right? And so I need to be able to know to convert from one to another. For my weight, I divide by what is it, 1.6, 1.8, to go from miles to kilometers, multiply, divide by 2.2, right? And so I'm just, I just know how to get from one to another. And that's the importance about teaching where you teach the idea of conversions. Okay, if you're in the United States, do you multiply or divide by the conversion factor? If you're in Europe, do you multiply or divide by the conversion factor? So I think it's a, a beautiful thing, different representations, just like you have different languages. Thank you. Yes. And that was fantastic, by the way. I've never had anyone to go through that mathematics, that much mathematics with me. I love it. <laughs> that was fun. When um, when you were growing up and, and learning math, you said that you had an affinity for math, but then uh, your your classmates probably didn't have such an affinity. So um, did you did you jump a lot of grades uh, with with your uh, with your talent for math? Uh, what was it like? When I was in the uh, once once I left third grade, I was put into a fourth, fifth, sixth grade split, and so. And a lot of the work was geared more towards the sixth graders. And so I was a fourth grader learning with the older students. And I remember the teacher, she made caramel the first year I was in that class and we were working with fractions. Um, and so that was again, one of the earlier ways of showing me how interesting mathematics could be. When I was in eighth grade, I took my mathematics classes, not with my eighth grade teacher, but I would travel to Limbo and take algebra with the ninth grade students. And then when I got to high school, I had the option to graduate a year early, but I chose to stay with my classmates because they were fun. Um, and I wanted to do the whole four year experience. Um, but also I was in the AOK program at Principal Scholars. And in Principal Scholars, we would take field trips, which when I think back on this, this would have been great for all students, right? Because what we did on those field trips, we would visit different colleges, go to different labs and see the applications of mathematics. And I think if other students, not just the quote unquote, you know, mathematically gifted students, I think if all students would have saw that, that would have sparked the interest of more students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it's uh, uh, important for students to learn by um, getting out of their own neighborhood and seeing Absolutely. what's uh, mm -hmm. Yes. And, and in uh, previous interviews um, with like um, people involved with, with gangs or people, people never got out of their own neighborhood. They never experienced downtown or the city of Chicago. They never went anywhere fun. They never left the state and they definitely never left the country. And, and that kind of experience could be life-changing, especially in Egypt of all places. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. And, and, and it sparked that interest. I mean, because the data shows, you know, being a high school principal, I have all this data, especially working with the University of Chicago, they love data, right? And so the data shows that uh, you increase a student's chance greatly just by them having a passport and a thought of traveling. And I just love the idea of traveling in uh, because I was one of those uh, young people for many years that did not travel or go anywhere. And when I got to high school, and, I'm sorry, college, and was able to travel when I started volunteering at, to go to Paris and to go to these other places, it just gave me a greater appreciation and respect for people that did not look like me. Because when I was in Chicago, I only saw black people. 
the first time I saw a black person speak in Spanish, and first of all, I don't even know if it was Spanish. I just assumed that it was English and Spanish because I hadn't seen anything else. They could have been speaking anything, but I was forward to see a black person speaking another language because I hadn't been anywhere, I hadn't experienced anything. And so you eliminate so many ignorances when you expose people to other places and other people. And oh my God, dare I say other foods. <laughs> I mean, it's just fantastic. When, but when we were first starting the, the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce, my best friend, Saring Dorji, um, he, he lived in India and he, he came to the United States and he's bringing his family in. Um, he brought me over to Devon Avenue and he was like, you need to experience the culture, okay? You need to experience the food. You need to hear the language. You need to understand the culture. And at some point in time, he said, before we incorporate the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce, the most diverse community in the entire city, if not nationwide, yes. I'm going to send you to India in two and a half weeks. Ooh. And I got my first passport and uh, he sent me to India to, to get the non-tourist tour with his family. Nice. And I got the culture. And there was nobody who looked like me or spoke like me. Um, and, and that was really, that was really an experience. And it was, it was life changing. Like I really became a different person after that. Yeah. And I got to go to Bangalore and then my store and then uh, historic Goa and then party Goa and all these different Tibetan settlements um, with the little monk kids. And it was, it was amazing. So yeah, that would, that, that kind of trip, is a life-changing experience. It changes your, your perspective on everything. Yes, absolutely. Aveta, how do you uh, uh, incorporate your curriculum for history? Do you have a team that, uh, that finds some of this history uh, and then uh, decides how to, how to incorporate it in the program? Because there is so much that you are teaching that is not available in, uh, in normal curriculum. So far as me, that's why I'm wanting to get into uh, uh, more schools and uh, build out a bigger team. Mm. Uh, because uh, like I said, I mean, the mathematics of course is important, but when you look at the technology and for me, the other children in different cultures, when I went, went to West Virginia, there was a lot of resistance because they were under the impression, the wrong impression that I was teaching critical, uh, critical uh, CRT, right? Critical race theory which is the furthest thing from the case. And the two women that were bringing me out, they were black women. The superintendent was white, but very open-minded. They were also nervous about me coming. At one point they called and said that they wanted to have the sheriff at my hotel room to make sure that I was safe, right? And so, you know, I told everyone, just calm down. At the end of the day, we're people. And for the most part, people do have sense. And there are actually more good people in the world than bad, but too often we focus so much on the bad. And I went there and it was a good experience. I went out running. I went down to Harper's Ferry. I was expecting great things and nothing but great things happened, right? And so when I was uh, speaking with the uh, teachers, you know, I was getting across to them. I started by asking them all to write on a sticky note why you went into teaching. And no one said, not one person said, I went into to teaching only to teach white children, only to teach white, you know, so I started there with what we all have in common. And that is wanting to be good, right? And it was a great thing. And when I did this with principals, there wasn't one black principal, they were all white principals. And after I was able to speak, it calmed down a lot of the noise. And they asked for me to come back again. And this time, because at first, you know, the schools, they didn't want our flyers up in their uh, schools. They were hesitant as far as even letting the parents know, even the black parents know about it. We ended up having some white students to come into the program. One white mom asked if the younger sibling could then jump in and join once I went out there to meet with them. This summer, last, this past Friday, I did a workshop for them. It was two white teachers that jumped in and volunteered. Uh, so there's huge possibility with this. And, you know, I know how to be patient and to meet people at the good part of their core. 
you meet people there instead of going in and say, oh my God, here go these white people. They're going to start with all this critical race theory. I said, no, they went into education because they wanted to be good. That's similar to me. I'm going to start right there and move from there. When you were a principal, how did your, um, uh, your job as a principal influence you in, uh, in what you did for a Black Mad Genius? Yeah, that's great. One of the things is, again, the importance of culture, the importance of people. And so one of the things I did when I became principal, one, I wanted a very diverse staff. I had uh, uh, what was BB from Iran, Christian, Muslim, men, women, Black, white, <laughs> uh, a Native American, Hispanic. I had a very diverse team. Uh, the, uh, at one year, there was a, uh, the Muslim man and woman that were on my team. I would allow them during the time that they needed to go over to pray. There was a spot at the University of Chicago that allowed uh, where Muslims would go. Up. I allowed that to happen. And so it really made me good with working with people. I would do a thing where I would go out with my teachers one at a time and just have a walk with them or, you know, have uh, coffee or tea with them. I didn't drink coffee. They would have coffee. I would have tea. You know, teachers love their coffee, but I would get to know them in their story. And for me, I think the white women teachers had the most impact on me. Uh, because oftentimes when they're wanted to be the heroes, they also sometimes seen as the villain in the data, right? Because we look at it and say, well, white women teachers are the majority teachers and look at what's happening, right? So here and there, here in my teacher's story made me really think about the importance of this culture piece. First, you know, for black people, because I'm black and I'm trying to help black people, but just in general, how important that was because I'm still friends with all of them now, right? Um, I went to New Orleans recently and Miss Steele, you know, white woman from the north side of Chicago. I asked her for a couple of spots. She sent me like 11 places to go eat. She loves New Orleans. I took my niece with her one time and we went to a jazz concert out in some suburb here. Another one of my teachers for the first time, I went to see her doing roller derby. I had never seen that before, right? So this idea of knowing other people I mean, it just erases so much ignorance and ignorance is at the root of, of racism, and, right? Uh, so for me, that, that is what my staff did for me, but also trusting other people that they're just as good as you are. You know, I, I respected their expertise and I let them go and, you know, I let them do their thing, but I also respected them at pe as, as people and I made sure that I, I paid them fairly. I got in trouble with that a lot at the University of Chicago. They decided, what is going on? Your personnel expenses are too high. I say, well, kill the technology. Bring me back uh, chalkboards. I don't care, but my team needs to be paid, right? Uh, but this idea of treating people well is, is what I got the most from that because they really appreciated it. Let's do a, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Let's do a community assessment with you. At WZID Chicago, being a nonprofit radio station, must be responsible to the community we serve. WZID is mandated to file quarterly issues with the FCC and on entertainment community focused programming. We like to assess the community for these quarterly issue topics with three questions. First, what is most important to you? Asada. What's most important to me is stopping this. Uh decline that we're on with the wealth gap in the black community. And my solution to that is get more students into STEM fields. Mm -hmm. What long-term problem must we address? Long-term problem we must address from a human perspective, we need to understand that we have more in common than we do differences and how to respect each other's differences. That was squash so much of what we have going on right now because I enjoy other people. I enjoy learning from other people, different cultures, different foods. For me, that would be the immediate one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what problem must be resolved now? The other one was like the long-term problem and this is like the problem to resolve now. The problem to resolve now 
Hmm. Yeah, because I'm so focused on the low term, low term one. Right. You know what? Oh, the problem we must uh, resolve right now, our parents need to get our children back on track from the pandemic. It's very basic. This summer, when I'm asking students how their day is going or how you feeling this morning, I'm all energetic. They'll tell me either they're good or not good. And here's, cause I always have to do because. They always say, because I did or didn't eat breakfast or because I did or didn't go to sleep last night. Right now, parents have to go back to parenting. Tech, iPads, iPhones, those are not parents. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, Asada Moore, thank you so much for joining us today on WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM and for um, all your insight and all your great work at Black Matt Genius. Thank you so much, and I hope to uh, see you all again. Yes, and thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill, your milk. You have to invite me to a, a chamber of commerce meeting. I have to visit my old hometown. I'd love to invite you over to, to all kinds of, of good events. Um, we do a lot of community events and, and we want to invite you into our community and we want to invite and welcome Black Math Genius to our community. I'm looking forward to doing a ribbon cutting with you for something that you're doing in our community. We'd love to have you. Oh, and I would love to be there. <laughs> I will be there, matter of fact. We'll get those dates together. Thank awesome. you. Thank all right. You. Thank you both. Thank you. Be safe.